outrun you. <laughs> Same lesson. You can't be the weakest one, the most vulnerable one there. You cannot be that one. You ever see these nature shows that they have on television where the antelopes are running in a herd and the lions are sneaking up on them? Have you ever seen the lion go after the swiftest or the strongest of the antelope? He picks the weakest one, only they call it the thinning of the herd or the survival of the fittest. But it's the same thing. He's picking the most vulnerable one. These people are stronger than you are. They're swifter than you are. But you're probably smarter than they are. You know, when we throw these bad guys up against the wall and search them, we don't find any Mensa cards in their pockets. And I don't think we have any out-of-work rocket scientists making license plates in Joliet. But you're dealing with people, although they have excellent instincts, they have hockey score IQs. But they pick their victims. And they pick their victims on this vulnerability scale. The most vulnerable one is the one who gets it. It's targets of opportunity. If they have an opportunity to steal a purse, they'll steal a purse. If they have an opportunity to steal a car, they'll steal a car. Whatever is there. That's what they'll do. It doesn't mean that you have to be tough in one area. You've got to be tough in all your areas. Let me, let me show you something. Who's got a purse? Let me see a purse. Let me see. Oh, yeah, that's a beauty. That's a 40-pounder. <laughs> all right, I only generalize once, and I'm going to do that here. This is the way that the American woman walks down the street. She walks down the street with a shoulder bag over her shoulder, coat buttoned up, and her other thing. American women always carry two things. <laughs> and she walks down the street like, like she's looking for quarters, just like this. <laughs> well, you can't do that. You gotta walk around with your head up. You do, you remember, predators walk around looking at other things. The people who are prey walk around looking at the ground, just like in the animal world. The predator is always looking out, and the sheep and the rabbit looking at the ground. So if you don't want to be a prey, look like a predator. I'm going to show you three women as they walk down the street. And we're going to see who's the most vulnerable. First one we call Barbara. Now, Barbara is a businesswoman, business Barbara. Business Barbara's got her purse over her shoulder. She has a trench coat, her briefcase, her umbrella, and she's walking down the street. And she's concentrating on business. She's not thinking about safety, she's thinking about business. And she's walking down the street and the purse is behind her. And as she's walking down the street, it swings around like this and it bounces, just as she walks down the street. And that's woman number one. Woman number two, now she's a little tougher. So we give her a tougher name. We give her a T name. We'll call her Tess. Okay. Now Tess carries her purse over her shoulder like this, and if there's a flap on the purse, it's toward her. And when she's, she walks down the street, she's got this baby. She walks down the street, but she's holding on to this purse. She's got it. That's woman number two. Now, woman number three is real tough, so I call her Rita. Now, Rita, Rita keeps her purse just like Tess does, only Rita puts her purse on first and then puts her coat on. Now, these three women are walking down the street, one right behind the other, in any order you want to put them in. And if Goof comes out of the alley to steal a purse, whose purse is he going to take? every time not because she's younger or older or weaker or stronger but because she's more vulnerable that's what he does so the idea is you cannot be the most vulnerable one there you got to be strong there's only one way to carry a purse safer than the way Rita carries it and that is with a fanny pack Weigh this one out. Two women are walking down the street. One's got the little pocketbook on her arm, and the other's got a fanny pack that nobody can see. Which one is the most vulnerable target? These are easy to do. Another thing we got to talk about, once the victim is selected, 
All right, let me put it to you this way. A shark is the most perfect killing and eating machine that God ever created. He never made anything that kills it as effectively and as efficiently as a shark does. It is absolutely magnificent the way it does these things. But even a shark does not come by at 35 miles an hour and snap somebody's head off. That's not what happens. What does the shark do? The shark comes off and it wants to see what it's doing. So it gets real close to people. But a shark has bad eyesight, so it has to bump into them. So the shark puts his face down and he bumps into whatever he wants. He wants to see what it is. And then he comes back around and then he takes it. Well, that's the same way these guys do it on the street. Only the bump is not physical. It's a verbal bump. They come up to you and they ask you questions. They ask you questions that require an answer. They want to see the fear in your eyes. They want to hear the fear in your voice as you answer these questions. And they get right up in your face. They get close. I mean real close. When the guy asks you a question, he wants, which way is Clark Street? You got change for a dollar? You got a cigarette? What he's doing is invading your space. When he asks you if you got change for a dollar, you got change for a dollar. There's one of them that's going to stand up there and she's going to open her purse and she says, no, all I got is this 20. <laughs> I mean, it's like it says Iowa right across her forehead, you know? <laughs> you got you to gotta know that that's going to happen. Now, they say it's a jungle out there, okay? And if you're walking along a path in the jungle and you heard a twig snap behind you, do you think you would turn around in a New York second? But you're walking along the, the streets, big city. You hear a car door slam. You hear the sound of running feet. You know what you do? You go, gee, I hope he runs by me. <laughs> they can't do that either. You got to turn around and look at him. You got to see what's happening. You know when there's a problem, when the hair on the back of your neck stands up and you say, uh-oh. When you say that uh-oh to yourself, that's when you know there's a problem. Something is wrong. Yeah, when you think something's wrong, then something is wrong. Now, when you turn around, I'm not saying to turn around and give him the big smile, but you turn around and see what he's doing. Then you have more time to react. And it's not just as they walk by, it's as they drive by. Let me show you a thing we call smash and grab. Okay, you're driving in your automobile. You got your purse here, right here in the seat. Now, it doesn't matter if you have it set here. Let me explain. I had a woman, this is what I've seen them do. They take the purse, they put it, put it around the back, and they tie the knot. Then you take the seatbelt, put it around here once, and click that baby. Now, that purse is not going to go anywhere. But he can't tell that. He sees you drive by, see the purse sitting on the seat, he's going to try for that purse. So whether he can get that purse out of there or not, you're still going to have a broken window. Now, what if I put the purse in the back seat? He breaks the back window. Where does the purse belong? Well, he cannot see it. Because if he can't see it, he's not going to try for it. Because if he can't see yours, you got to remember that three cars behind you there's a woman driving down the street with a thing on her seat. Now, where does this purse belong? I'll tell you where it belongs. purse belongs right underneath your knees, like this. He can't see it. He ain't going to try for it. That's where it is. Now, if you're sitting on the other side, somebody else is driving. You're sitting with the purse here. Window break. You cover your face purse is gone. And whoever's sitting here isn't going to be able to catch him either. You can't catch this 13-year-old kid in gym shoes. It's really impossible to do. Where does the purse belong? Under your knees. He can't see it. He won't try for it. Now, let's say you got a big purse, and you're sitting on this side with a big purse that won't fit comfortably under here. What you do is you put it real high on the right-hand side of the car, real high. You lay it up there so it looks like a, like a format. Or if you have a briefcase, you put that up there. It's 
dark color. It looks like a floor mat. I hate telling you that, though, because I know if I tell you to do that, it's going to end up right there. So I'd rather have you keep it under your knee. That's the safest place for you to put your purse. The only other place for you to put your purse is in the trunk of your car. And that's where the lady who's ahead of me in the toll booth line usually has hers. <laughs> see, actually there were two jokes, see? Another thing we gotta worry about, let's talk about walking into a bank. You walk into a bank, there's this counter when you walk right into the bank. And then that counter, there are different slips, and they mean different things. Some of them are deposit slips, some of them are withdrawal slips, some of them are checking, some of them are all kinds of slips. Bad guy's out in front, he's watching. He can see, because they're all color-coded, he can see what color slip is picked up. Customer walks over to this first table. Customer picks up a savings withdrawal slip. That's the big one. I mean, big money's coming out. He sees it, walks right over to her car with the ice pick, once through the tire, gets back in his car, and he waits. She comes walking out of the bank, doesn't flash her money, got it in her purse. She walks right into her automobile, locks the door, and she drives away. Everything is fine. Three blocks later, she has this flat tire, and this nice man comes up and says, Can I help you? Pow! Now, where did she go wrong? Well, we can't get the banks to change the color of their slips, but what we can do is have you go to the back, take the slip from the back counter. Don't take them from the front counter because they can see you from the door. You have to weigh these things and make sure that you come out on the top end of the stick. And that's what that's all about. Being a tough target also means when you're driving down the street, it doesn't have to be an abandoned area. It doesn't have to be a lonely highway. It doesn't have to be an alley. All it's got to do is be someplace that you're not comfortable. You're driving down the street. As you're driving down the street or the highway, somebody bumps into the back of your car. You pull it over to the side. You get out, and you look at it, and you say, my God, look at that. Well, you don't do that. You do not get out of the car. You stay inside that automobile and you roll the window down only that far, because the only thing that's going to come out of that is your voice. You take your driver's license out from that plastic thing you keep it in, and you push it right up against the window and let him read it through the glass. Because I know if you slip that driver's license out the window and he won't give it back, you're going to come out of that car to get it, and I don't want you out of that car. According to the way the laws are written, you have to identify yourself. The actual exchange of driver's licenses never has to happen. If he won't identify himself, that's fine. Get his license plate. Keep your door locked and drive away. Now, where do you go? Well, where were you going? If you were driving to work, go to work. And what do you do when you get there? You call and say, look, I had an accident. Mile marker 57. I-55. 11.30 at night. And if this guy was legit, those two reports are going to find one another. And you're going to be fine. And if he's not legit and doesn't file a report, you don't care because you're safe. You do not have to put yourself into personal jeopardy to fill out a form for an insurance company. You don't have to do it. No insurance company can require you to do that. The idea is for you to be safe. What if the car is disabled? You take that sunshade that you use to put in the front over your dashboard to keep the sun out in the summertime. You take the black or dark blue magic marker and you write the word help call police on it and you put it in the back window. And any car that comes by is going to be able to call the police. And everybody, there's 100,000 new cellular phones every day and they've all got them out there. And somebody can call the police or they can got a CD radio or the truckers will call. They will come by and help you. That's what you've got to do. And you have to stay in the car. Now, the reason I, I started to laugh is because I had one woman ask me one time, if the, if the car is on fire, do I know? If the car is on fire, you can get out of the car. But if the car is not on fire, stay in the car. 
I don't want you wandering down the highway. You're much more vulnerable wandering down the highway than you are in your car. Now, if this guy starts pounding on your car, if he, if he starts banging on the front of it, or you're doesn't even have to be in an accident site. If somebody approaches you in a car and says, hey, get out of the car, I want to talk to you. Uh-uh, you got your doors locked, you got your engine started. They say, come on, out of the car, I want to talk to you. No, no, you start that engine up. Now the guy's in front of your car and he's beating on the hood and he won't get out of the way. What do you think you should do? Put it in gear. <laughs> now what do you do now? You drive away. Now, you notice how slowly I said the word drive. I don't want you to say, well, J.J. said it was okay, so I revved that baby up to 35 and I dropped it. <laughs> you drive away, and that's exactly what you do. You just drive away. But you've got to give them a reasonable chance to get out from in front of the car. Now, that's what being a tough target is all about. Tough targets don't get selected. And that's the first part of the plan is tough targets. We'll be right back with more information that could save your life. But before we do, join me in showing support for your public television station. Remember, we need to protect our most valuable assets, ourselves. second part of the plan it's called denying privacy now the dying privacy not only means that you have to go toward where there are people and go toward the light and, uh, and away from the darkness or the where the group is and all that other denying privacy stuff that is so basic and you've heard over and over and over again denying privacy also means how to manage private places that you cannot deny elevators you're waiting for the elevator. The door open. You don't like who's on the elevator. Don't get on the elevator. Don't get on. Now what happens if you're on the elevator? You're on the elevator and the door opens, you don't like who gets on. Get off! Now you're standing next to the buttons because you're smart. You stand next to the buttons on the elevator. Somebody gets on that you don't like, you push that open, open the door button. You push it, oops, my floor, excuse me. Then you get right off the elevator. The problem is oh, you're off the elevator. Now what happens if you get caught on an elevator? You're on an elevator. And somebody attacked you. didn't look so bad, so you, you didn't get off. And now he's attacking you on the elevator. So he, he, he spins you around, starts to rip at your clothes. What are you going to do? Well, what do you think you should do? The one thing you not do is push that red button. And I'll tell you why. The red button is the only button on that elevator that stops the elevator. You don't want that elevator to stop. Stop the elevator gives him privacy, not you. You don't want that to happen. You want that elevator to move. Here's what happened. 